Things is grim. Um, Bill Perry, former Secretary of Defence, General Cartwright and many others are saying that we're closer to nuclear war now than we were at the height of the Cold War. Have I got water? Yes. The height of the Cold War. Why? Because we've all, we've all forgotten about it. You know, most of us are older. You know, I look, how many young people are there? Hands up. <laughs> Stand up the young ones. Yeah, well, most young people are playing the Pokemon thing, someone told me. At Berkeley, they can't get anyone's attention. They're all on their po... I mean, anyway, so the ignorance is profound in this country, mostly because of Fox and CNN and all those blasted television stations who put Trump on all the time. They've created Trump because he's good for ratings. He sells lots of Viagra and hemorrhoid cream and all those ghastly drugs. <laughs> that everyone's advertising, they say, now take this for your heart, it's very good, and there's a picture of a very beautiful woman. And then they say the side effects are kidney damage, you know, prostate damage, liver damage, if you're depressed, don't take it. And then they have another picture of a nice girl and the drug. I mean, it's obscene, medically obscene. How are you going to make a decision about what drugs to take? How dare they advertise? to ordinary people who have no knowledge of medicine or pharmacology or anything like that. It's obscene. Anyway, he's selling lots of stuff for them. So they've created him. And, you know, Bernie had, you know, 30,000 people in an auditorium and CNN focused on an empty stage waiting for Trump to appear. It's obscene. This country is totally out to lunch in every single way. So, what's been happening? Well, I'll go back to the beginning. Gorbachev met with an American representative when the Cold War ended and he allowed the Berlin Wall to come down. And they promised that they would not enlarge NATO into all the newly released Eastern European countries. That wasn't good for business for Lockheed Martin. Norman Augustine, who ran Lockheed Martin and virtually ran the Pentagon. If you read my book, The New Nuclear Danger, George Bush's Military Industrial Complex, you'll read about Norman Augustine. He was a sociopath. Brilliant, erudite, charming, with no moral conscience. Like Rumsfeld, like Cheney, like many others. Um, and they're the ones that rise to the top like cream because they're neurotic, they're very much driven, and they're at the same in ha at Harvard and Berkeley and uh, corporations and, and the government. So we're run, I mean, one in 25 people are psychopaths, but if you look at people in power, many are psychopaths. No sociopaths, sorry, sociopaths. No moral conscience. Anyway, so offset Norman Augustine to all these little tiny newly liberated countries, Poland, Czechoslovakia, and the like. And he said, do you want to become a democracy? Well, America isn't a democracy. You don't even vote. At home, Australia, voting is compulsory. We get fined $80 if we don't vote. And we're all registered to vote. And that's what you should be doing. It should be compulsory. You know, they've got all your addresses and everything. Um, why isn't it so, so that the very rich stay in power? So you need a revolution of the people. Of the people, for the people, and by the people. Anyway, so off he went, but to join NATO, you had to pay $3 million or much more to arm. So therefore, they had to buy weapons, and that was good for Lockheed Martin. And war is good for Lockheed Martin and Boeing and Northrop Grumman and Raytheon and all the other god-awful killing companies that you pay for with your tax dollars to the tune of a trillion dollars a year. And you have no free health care, no free education. You're being screwed. <laughs> I don't know why people are so sort of passive, you know? <laughs> I suppose it's the television. You watch television and you go into an alpha, 
uh, for activity in the brain and you get really almost anaesthetized. And all these messages come into you very fast and you don't have time to think about it, but they register in your brain. So you walk into the, I'm tangentializing. I've gone on tan uh, tangents. And you go into the supermarket and there's a thing that's just been advertised and although you don't believe in advertising, you pick it up because you've been brainwashed and conditioned to buy that. Okay? You don't believe me? Well, a lot of people do that. It's been shown. Anyway, so Norman Augustine, I don't know how I got off on that track. He convinced all those little countries to join NATO. So NATO moved up. NATO is America. Moved up to the border of Russia. And that Russians didn't like that. It's like Russia declaring Canada is their ally. And they start moving their troops right up to your border. What would you do? You'd blow up the world. Because you nearly did with the Cuban Missile Crisis. And they just put a few missiles there. I knew Robert McNamara towards the end of his life, and he, he was in the Oval Office. And he said, Helen, you don't know how close we came to within three minutes. Now, remember that as I talk, within three minutes. So um, then the neocons in the State Department, Victoria Newland, who's married to Robert Kagan, who's a very bad man. Neocons, uh, I don't know why they're called neocons. Um, they're radical. We're conservatives because we want to conserve life on Earth. But the people who want to blow it up and build more weapons, they're radical. And let's name them for who they are and what they are. Um, so they orchestrated a coup in the Ukraine. What happened was Yanukovych, who was democratically elected by the Ukrainians, um, he was approached by the EU to join the EU. And to join the EU, you have to tighten your belt like Greece and Spain, and you lose your benefits of free education and free healthcare and the like. And he really didn't know what to do, and he appealed to Putin. Putin gave him some money to tide over, and he said, let's wait for six months and see what happens. So, but in the interim, Victoria Newland set up a coup and in Maiden Square there was a big demonstration and a sniper firing and killing people and it got really rough and scary and Yanukovych fled to Russia. And in his stead was put Poroshenko, who's a crook. And not just a crook, he's, he's, well, he's a crook in terms of money but other things too. And he's working with the Nazis. Now, there were a lot of Nazis in the Ukraine who've risen up again, and that's the army, and they're being funded and armed by the United States. How dare the United States do that? How dare the United States interfere in any other country on Earth? It's not as if you don't have enough problems of your own to fix. But, you know, the world's policemen, we don't want to be policed. You've got bases in almost every country of the world, including many in my country. And my country's got no guts to stand up to you. I'm saying you in a generic way. Um, and so he fled. Poroshenko got in. Now, the people on the eastern side of the Ukraine were very Russian, and they wanted to maintain their benefits, and they didn't like what was happening. So they stood up to these people. And so, so what's happening is Poroshenko's military are moving in, and they've killed a lot of people, and I can't remember exactly the number, but it's an awful lot of people. And so there's a war going on. And so Putin was obliged to kind of support those people. He did not invade. Then there was the Crimea. Now, the Crimea, they voted 96% to stay with Russia, 96%. And, you know, the Crimea has been part of Russia since Catherine the Great. And they've got a warm water port at Sebastopol there, and it's very important for Russia. Um, so that's, that's an area of acute friction between Russia and America. Meanwhile, the US has the audacity to practice NATO exercises right on the border of Poland, border with Russia, and install anti-missile bases in Russia and Romania. Well, what are they for? Oh, they say they're for Iran. <laughs> Fat lot of good that is. It's not Iran, it's Russia. 
and they can launch nuclear missiles there that can hit Moscow in a few minutes, not the normal 30 minutes it takes to go from America to Russia. So the Russians are pretty antagonized. Then there's Syria, where Russia is supporting Assad, who is democratically elected. I know he's an awful man, but you don't go and kill a lot of people in a country and destroy their history in Aleppo and these wonderful ancient cities uh, because you don't like the guy in charge. You know, a lot of people didn't like George W., but they didn't have the ability to come and, you know, kill you. But that's what's going on now. It's just hideous, hideous. And... Why is that happening? Because Russia has a warm water port in the Mediterranean, in Syria. And Julian Assange, you know, he's just been released by the Swedes. Today I heard that they're not going to arrest him. He's been freed. Now, I think if he gets out, America will grab him and put him in solitary confinement. But anyway, he was on a big screen at a big meeting we had in Sydney, Australia. And we were asking him questions for an hour. And I said, what did the emails show about America before they started funding these, quotes rebels, ISIS and all the others, to go into Syria? And he said it was planned for about five years before it actually started to happen. Uh, so invading another country, well, there's oil there. <laughs> and there's a big oil pipeline. And that's now being defended by these people who are working with the United States. That's another area of severe fi friction. Meanwhile, um, Russia and America own 93% of the 16,000 hydrogen bombs in the world. Ni oh, oh, what about North Korea? Ooh, they could blow up a city. Only you and only Russia can destroy life on the planet. Evolution. So who are the real terrorists in the world? Russia and America. You've got over a thousand hydrogen bombs on hair trigger alert in those missile silos. If you fly over Dakota, north and south in Colorado, you can look down and see them. There are little roads going to a round circle like a spider's web all around. In those missile silos are two men aged 18 to 21. Yes, sir, no, sir, press the button, sir. Each is armed with a pistol, one to shoot the other if one shows signs of deviant behavior. What if the deviant one shoots the other one? The locks are 12 feet apart to launch the missile, but they've worked out a key and string trick. You can tie a, a key on a, on a string and one man can turn both locks. They are run by floppy disks. The telephones often don't work. They get really bored down there. It's, no, it's not very good to be one of the officers in the Air Force because there's no way to go up upwards in the Air Force. Uh, 72 of them have been discharged for cheating or taking drugs. The um, officer in charge of the whole all of the missile silos, and there are about 420, each missile silo has one missile with about three hydrogen bombs. Some have been decreased, but you know, they're Minutemen, they're, they're called Minutemen, nice word. Three hydrogen bombs. Um, the man in charge of this whole thing, it's called a wing, I don't know why, uh, went to Moscow and he got drunk and he cavorted with naughty women and he wanted to sing karaoke, and he did naughty things, so he was fired. Inappropriate. He was the boss. There was another boss who, um, who was a gambling addict, <laughs> and he was caught, I don't know, in Reno or something, somewhere gambling, so he was fired too. Now, these are the men in charge of the future of the planet, right? So what happens? Um, how could it happen? Well, in 1967, I just read this today and posted it on Facebook and Twitter, there was a solar storm, 19, and you know what happens, the sun sends out huge fires, and, and it affected the magnetic fields in the Earth, and it, it triggered the satellites to indicate Russia had launched nuclear weapons. Uh, squadrons of planes were already in the air flying B-52s to bomb Russia. Uh, incidentally, those planes, the men always flew with a patch over one eye 
because when they dropped their bombs, they would be blinded by the flash. So then they could take the patch off and have vision in one eye and fly home. Except that when there's a nuclear war, there's so much dust in the air, like a volcano, that it clogs up the engines of the jets and they crash. Anyway, even if they could get back, where do they land? Because America will be destroyed. Coast to coast, north to south. Anyway, they were there, all ready to, in the air, ready to fly into Russia to bomb them. That's one time. Another time, in 95, um, America had a weather satellite in Norway it was going to launch. It warned the Pentagon, but the Pentagon's sort of hopeless. It loses stuff. You know, so often a Russian comes and films me, and they're all in their black leather jackets and stuff, and then they come ha half an hour later and say, sorry, Dr. Caldecott, the camera didn't work. Can we do you again? And so they're not terribly efficient, to say the least. And they forgot. The satellite goes up and it's picked up by their over-horizon radar, and there's Yeltsin, a hardened alcoholic, a bottle of vodka before breakfast. <laughs> Wernicke's encephalopathy, Korsakoff syndrome. I'm a, a real alcoholic, because I know, because I know someone who brought him to New York to go on television, and he went to his hotel room to get him in the morning. He was sitting on the suitcase, drinking his bottle of vodka. And he's sitting there with the suitcase, the football open. Now, if you watch the president, always walking just behind him is a man with a suitcase, and it's called the football. It's an officer. In the football are the codes for the president to start a nuclear war. When Reagan was shot, they lost the football for two days. <laughs> so they'd opened the football for the first time ever in Moscow, and there's Yeltsin, an alcoholic, with his General standing over his shoulder saying, Mr. P President, press that button. He had three minutes to decide. Three seconds before that three minutes elapsed, the missile veered off course and they realised they were not under attack. We were three minutes from annihilation. Cuban Missile Crisis, three minutes from annihilation. Someone plugged a war games tape into the computers in the Pentagon and they thought they were under attack. In fact, they called Brzezinski. He was Carter's foreign secretary, and Brzezinski had to go and wake up Carter and tell them they were under attack, but he realised just before he woke up Carter. No, but do you know what? This happens frequently. And I sit here and look at you all, and I don't know how we're still here. It's a miracle. I told my family, I'll be home if there's not a nuclear war, and I mean it. On 9-11, the Air Force went to the highest state of nuclear alert because no one knew what was happening. George Bush was reading my pet goat to, upside down to a kindergarten class in Florida. <laughs> Cheney was in the war room underneath. You know, he's in charge, Cheney, the sociopath. <laughs> and uh, and the, no one knew. So case of high international anxiety. And so the Air Force put its missiles on the highest state of alert from DEFCON 5... Four, three, two. And that's the, low, the highest before they launch. Now, that was on their website for a couple of days. I found it, but they took it off pretty fast. So any sort of international anxiety could trigger a nuclear war, and we're at a time of high international tension now. And I think, supposedly, Putin's probably paranoid. Why not? Being threatened by the United States with missiles right on his border. I know medically you don't threaten a paranoid patient or they're likely to do something very extreme and hurt you. This is stupidity, absolute. What we should be doing, and I have to say Trump's a, a nutter, but at least he says we should make friends with Putin. Of course we should make friends with Putin. Of course we should. And Hillary Cor compares him to Hitler. She's a nutter. She's very close to the neocons. In the State Department, she's married to the establishment. She's never seen a war she didn't like. She killed Gaddafi. She said, we came, we saw, we came, and he died. I'm not quite sure. How dare she say that? They sodomised him with rifles up his anus. And now what's happened to Libya? It's destroyed. All the ancient tribes are all fighting, which is exactly what happened in Iraq. Saddam Hussein went to Princeton. 
When he was 21, he was recruited by the CIA. He was a CIA man in Iraq till he got under their skin a bit and started to say, you know, we might nationalise the oil fields or something. So then they, they invaded and killed him in a, what did they call it, a spider's hole or something. And now look what's happened to Iraq. And that awful guy, Brenner, who was in charge, went to Iraq and he dismissed all the officers and all the officials in the government who are Sunnis and put in Shias. Now, you know about Sunnis and Shias. They're at each other's throats, ancient animosities. I suppose like the animosities in Ireland between the Catholics and the Protestants. And, and so things fell into disrepair. I remember they were dropping wires, sort of nets, over the towns and villages to short, short all the electricity systems, so they had no electricity. Um, they've bombed the hospitals, they've used depleted uranium, which lasts for, well, its half-life is 4.5 million years, that's uranium-238. Children being born in Basra, Fallujah, and, and uh, the capital, what's the capital? Um, Baghdad, with gross congenital anomalies, babies born with no brains, and encephaly. They've got a skull, and on the base of the skull is the mid, a knob and a midbrain, so they cry and they cough and they suck. I've delivered such a baby, and they die within a week. Babies are being born with no arms, no legs, or with their abdominal viscera exposed because the two muscles didn't fuse in the centre of their stomach. And there's a very high incidence of childhood cancer. Um, I wrote an article for the New York Times about this about 10 years ago, and they said, we are unable to publish this. If you look at the literature of the Pentagon, they've known forever the dangers, medical dangers of uranium. It's totally well documented. We used to use it in medicine in our ignorance. So um, these men, Gaddafi and Hussein, tough they, they, though they were, like... Who was the guy in uh, Yugoslavia who died? Yeah, Tito, when he died, the whole thing fell apart because you need a tough person to keep these warring tribes under control. And America, in its stupidity, goes in and kills these guys and the whole thing falls, into, falls apart. Same thing's really happening in Syria. Now, where am I? So a nuclear war could start by a hacker. These young kids aged 16, usually always, always boys, um, with very poor frontal lobe development. My grandson, I mean, he'd walk through with his mates, high grams, he'd say, and you wouldn't know what they were up to. <laughs> Smart. And I talked at the University of Minnesota recently, and there was a very good computer expert, and I said, well, why hasn't it happened yet? You know, a young kid hacking into the early warning system. He said, well, they just haven't worked out how to do it yet. There are over a 1,000 hackers real ones into the Pentagon every day. Um, so it could happen by hacker, by accident, as I've described, and there are many, by international tension, or, you know, say North Korea did set off a nuclear weapon, or say India and Pakistan started to do it, because they're very much at war. That could set up th off the whole global nuclear war, like on 9-11. And what would happen? Well, let me tell you. America's official policy now is to fight and win a nuclear war. It hasn't changed. Even under Obama, who's got, who is spineless. He's got no spine. He, he was a, he's a commander in chief, he has a bully pulpit. If it'd been like FDR, he would have inspired the Americans, he would have taught them and led them and said to the Pentagon, no, because he would have taken you with him like FDR did. And remember how everyone so loved him? We just went to Campobello, where he developed polio. Really your last great president. Anyway, um, I'm off on my train of thought, yeah. Now, how do you win a nuclear war? Well, you um, send over a missile, hydrogen bomb, and take out Moscow. So you decapitate 
and this is military terminology, decapitate Putin so he can't press his button. Then, at the same time, you launch two hydrogen bombs on each missile silo, landing within seconds of each other so you don't get fratricide, another Pentagon term, killing your brother, because all the debris created with the next bomb coming in will damage the bomb, so it's got to be very accurate. You can do that. And then you've destroyed their missiles and you've won the nuclear war. It's Second World War thinking or First World War thinking. These guys are out to lunch. I mean, the male reptilian midbrain, you know, poisoned by testosterone. I mean, even a child will say, but, but Grandma, why? Because they're more intelligent than these men and women. So, but the Russians don't want to lose the nuclear war and lose their missiles. So they've dug a great big cave in the Ural Mountains with a missile called the Dead Hand. Now, I know the guy who orchestrated this and planned it. He's dead now, lovely man. And it goes up and it sends a message by radio to all the missiles in Russia to launch the missiles by computer control. So we're in the hands of nutters. Well, Trump said, well, we've got nuclear weapons. Why can't we use them? I mean, it's an obvious question, isn't it? It's what a kindergarten kid would say. Some people say he's like a kindergarten kid in a way. And Hillary, I think, no, I shouldn't say that. I was going to say something bad. Well, I wonder if she's got an arenoblastoma on her ovary, which secretes testosterone. No, that's a bit rude. That's a bit rude. Anyway, um, now how would it work? Now, you know sometimes you're listening to NPR and you hear, woo, we are just testing the emergency broadcasting system. Well, this time, the weapons take half an hour to go from launch to land. And you know, it's some Russian weapons that are going to kill you. So you have to be friends with the Russians so they don't launch their missiles to kill you. It's just crazy. I mean, any, well, a kindergarten child would understand that. There are 12 hydrogen bombs targeted on New York as I speak, and the Russian bombs are big. Many times orders of magnitude bigger than Hiroshima and Nagasaki. 12, well, I've targeted at each airport. This is how they target. And the bridges and the tunnels and, you know, the major centres in Wall Street, 12. They're probably more targeted on Washington. Every town and city with a population of 50,000 or more is targeted with at least one hydrogen bomb. Same in Canada. And since the Cold War ended, America decided to target China too in its benefic beneficence. And the whole of Europe's targeted England, Canada, Australia, Japan. Now, so you're, um, you've got your radio on and you hear, Woo! this is not a test, we're under nuclear attack. You will get about five minutes notice if that. Because what happens is the satellites in the air pick up the shine, the sunshine on the missiles. The missiles are called buses and their passengers are called, uh, their passengers are the hydrogen bombs. And through space it's called moving, multiple independent re-entry vehicles. So they send up the missile, then, the, then the, from the bus the passengers are released, flying separately, and, and their reflections are picked up by your satellites. And that radio is back to the Strategic Air Command in Omaha, Nebraska, and I went there to speak to the chief in charge years ago, and there's a big gate over which says, peace is our profession, which is like that sign over Bilson, is it? Work is our something or other? Yeah, it's like that. He was ardently against the Russians and the communists, and he had missiles on every, I talk about missile envy, my book, which I wrote years ago. <laughs> Well, they are. You know, they, you watch a missile. It's like a, an erection with two big balls of fire. It is. And the language they use in the military is missile erector, soft lay down, deep penetration, hard line and soft line, nuclear war with one big orgasmic wump. And they say that in front of women with no sense of embarrassment at all.
Anyway, had all, and for half an hour I argued with this guy, and then I finally said, have you got grandchildren? And his face softened, and he said, yes. I said, how many? He said, two. How old are they? Two and eight months. And I got him. It's like how, how Carter got Saddam and who was the, um, not Saddam, Arafat. yeah, Arafat at the Camp David Peace Accords because they showed pictures of their grandchildren. You have to get to where people live. So um, the missile takes, and the bombs, their passengers take half an hour to go from launch to land. Meanwhile, your satellites pick the attack up and the other side launches. So the whole thing's over in about an hour. They would say, run to the nearest fallout shelter. You won't know what, where one is, and no one's aware of this anymore anyway. The bomb will come in at 20 times the speed of sound, so you won't hear it, and land and explode with 10 or 20 times the heat inside the centre of the sun. E equals mc squared. The splitting of the atom changed everything, save man's mode of thinking. Thus we drift towards unparalleled catastrophe. Einstein. It will dig a hole three quarters of a mile wide and 800 feet deep, and this is the epicenter. Lovely San Francisco. And all of us and the buildings and the earth below ejected into the mushroom cloud into the stratosphere. Out to about five miles, everyone is vaporized. In Hiroshima, a little boy was reaching up to catch a red dra dragonfly against the blue of the sky. And there was a blinding flash, and he disappeared. And if you go to Hiroshima in the museum, there's his shadow on the pavement. It's the first time man had ever developed a method to vaporize his fellow human beings. A woman was running, holding a baby. She'd been converted into a charcoal statue. People were walking with skin just falling off their bodies. Eyes melted So they looked at the bomb. You need to know this. Winds of 500 miles an hour suck people out of buildings, turning them to missiles traveling at 100 miles an hour. Pieces of glass traveling at 100 miles an hour decapitate people. There's a book about the effects of nuclear war put out by the Pentagon and an equation how far a piece of glass traveling at 100 miles an hour penetrates human flesh. They've worked it all out. A firestorm of 3,000 square miles would then engulf this city, but don't forget it's not just one bomb, many on San Francisco, and the whole area would be burnt. Everything. Even in the middle of winter up in Boston, everything burns. And then the fires would coalesce across the country because everything's targeted. And the country would burn coast to coast, north to south. How is it we're still here? Fallible human beings. The president could get a cerebral tumour and do something crazy before the diagnosis is made. He could develop, well, Putin, acute psychosis. I've had patients who've been quite normal. Went to a business meeting, came home at the end, and he was psychotic, chasing his wife around the house. I went to try and inject him with chlorpromazine, um, and he was chasing, and I was chasing him around the house with a syringe, trying to stick it into his buttock, and he was putting his hand up my skirt, saying, bitch, bitch. He was psychotic, acute psychosis, and it can happen to anyone at any time. We are fallible. We make mistakes. We sometimes kill our patients because we make mistakes. But this is evolution. I've got a cottage garden outside my study, and I look at the flowers unfolding, and the butterflies coming in turquoise, this colour, and the birds. Millions of years of evolution we hold in the palm of our hand. And what happens is as everything burns, a huge cloud of black radioactive smoke is elevated into the stratosphere, circling the globe for 10 years, inducing a short ice age in the, and a nuclear winter. Maybe the moss and the algae will survive. 
There's nothing else that is more important now than for every American, like they did in the 80s, to understand what I'm saying. The final epidemic. Are we an evolutionary aberrant? I once asked Carl Sagan, Carl, do you think there's any other life in the universe? And he thought for a long time. And he said, no. And I said, why? And he said, because if any species had reached our stage of development, they would have destroyed themselves. You know, we're pretty primitive. I think it goes back to when we were troglodytes. I'm now writing a book called Why Men Kill and Why Women Let Them. Why are we so pathetic? 52% of us. And look at Congress, all these guys in ties, and ties is a symbol of you know what. <laughs> why are there monuments to men everywhere? You know, why is there in, in every square in Europe a killer on a horse? Why does Napoleon have a huge mausoleum in Paris when he killed thousands of people? Alexander the Great, why do we glorify war? What is patriotism about? Nationalism, it's rhubarb as we'd say in Australia. <laughs> this, this is not the greatest country on earth. In fact, you're really going down the drain. American exceptionalism, you're good at killing. You've got 325,000 guns, right? Million. Million, oh, hell. And anyone can go nuts and shoot anyone, and you do background checks, like fun you do background. You know what happened in Australia? We had a massacre. 15 years ago, the Prime Minister said, all guns are now illegal, you've got a hand in your guns, and they chopped them all up. No guns. Why don't you do that? God damn the NRA. These guys are evil. They're criminals. They should be locked up in jail. They should. They're killers. And your money... 60 to 65 cents of every discretion you tax dollar goes to killing. Why do you put up with it? And you'll say, well, what can I do? Okay, so I'll tell you what I did. One person can save the planet. I came here in 78. I was an alien. <laughs> and you go through security and they say, are you a communist? I didn't know what a communist was, really. Anyway, so I go through, and, and, um, <laughs> and I was a woman, and I was young, and a rusty doc. Well, I was at Harvard. And um, it, almost everyone I spoke to said, it's better to be dead than red. And I said, well, what about the pygmies in Africa? And they said, they don't want to be communist either. <laughs> and I thought, these people are actually psychotic. <laughs> they were. <laughs> So we organised physicians for social responsibility, 23,000 doctors, and we got on television, and I had an agent in Hollywood who worked for me for free, who put me in Vogue and Life and Time and Family Home Circle and 60 Minutes and Good Morning America. First time I ever was on television was with Merv Griffin and Zaza Gabor. <laughs> or Ava Gabor. And she had a sort of a dress, a pink silk taffeta off the shoulders with a big frill, and diamonds the size of pears hanging from her ears. And we were debating and she said, the Russians ro ro roll over children with tanks. And I thought, oh my God. And we went to a break and I had a drink of water and spilled it straight down my shirt because I was so nervous. <laughs> and then I came back and I said, you know, the children don't think they've got a future. And the audience started clapping. So I got in just under the wire. But it was very interesting. And by through television, as your wonderful President Jefferson said, an informed democracy will behave in a responsible fashion. This country is totally uninformed. Totally uninformed. The kids don't know what the hell's going on. They know about global warming. And that's, you know, will, will we end with a whimper or a bang? More likely a bang, I think. More likely. So the media is determining the fate of the earth. Rupert Murdoch, who actually created my career when I stood up against the French test by publishing front page editorials about me on the front of the Australian, the national newspaper. Then when I got into uranium, he turned against me because we all had to have two cars and chandeliers, you know. Three swimming pools was important. 
So he's uh, one of the most evil men in the world, if not the most evil. He broadcasts to two thirds of the world's population. We know about Roger Ailes and how he orchestrated it now, Fox and the like. So how do we get, um, how do we get the American people to know and we're all older? How many of you got grandchildren? Children? How many of you feel that your own life is sacred? That your sperm out of millions reached your egg that night? We have a sacred responsibility. We're just so lucky to be alive, to be here. And with that evokes enormous responsibility. We hold life on earth. This, this dahlia, in the palm of our hand. Now, you might think, well, you're too old, and what, what can I do? Every morning, get up in the mirror and look in your eyes and decide what you're going to do today to save the planet. And I mobilised with my fellow physicians and psychologists and architects for social responsibility. Even the morticians asked me to come and talk to their annual conference. And I said, what do you want me to talk to you for? And they said, we don't want to have to embalm radioactive bodies. <laughs> and I said, you'll be one yourself. You don't have to worry. But they passed a resolution against nuclear war. So in five years, we educated 80% of Americans to be opposed to the nuclear war concept. We had a million people in Central Park, the biggest rally ever in the history of this country. I spent an hour and a quarter with Reagan in the White House alone, holding his hand, trying to teach him about the medical and other effects of nuclear war. He knew nothing. He didn't know about Team B and Team A in the in the CIA, blue-green laces. He, he really was almost totally ignorant. And so I'd, I'd just written my book, Missile Envy, and I was full of facts and figures, so I'd stop him and correct him. You know, when he got anxious, he'd get red cheeks. It's called a malar flush. He'd get, so I'd have to hold his hand and reassure him. So I established a doctor-patient relationship with him. <laughs> I thought I'd had no influence. Um, but when and I came out saying, I thought, the diagnosis was impending Alzheimer's, which was accurate. Um, and, I, and then he started to say, nuclear war must never be fought and can never be won. And then Gorbachev saw doctors on Soviet television talking about the medical effects of nuclear war. And then he allowed the Berlin Wall to come down and the two men, Reagan and Gorbachev, met in Reykjavik. And I've just been to Reykjavik, but I went there years ago to address a big women's conference. And they met in a tiny little house, and it was all bare around with people with um, rifles around, surrounding the house. In one room was Reagan and Gorbachev. Next room sat Gor Schultz and Shepard Nazi. Upstairs was Richard Pearl, the Prince of Darkness, sitting on the lavatory, writing numbers on bits of lavatory paper because the Russians came totally prepared with proposals. The Americans came with nothing. So Gorbachev would say something and Reagan would then go and talk to Schultz who'd run upstairs to Richard Poole. And that's how it worked out. And downstairs, meanwhile, in the basement were the KGB drinking their vodka and one chucked a lighted match by accident into the waste paper basket It caught fire and the whole place nearly burnt down because of the KGB. Well, the Russians are alcoholics. You know, the soldiers used to drink the antifreeze liquid they put into their tanks. Um, and what happened was that they nearly got there to agree to abolish nuclear weapons, and Reagan got hung up on his Star Wars, who was, he was introduced to this by that wicked man, Edward Teller. It was a hot place in hell for Edward Teller. And Reagan imagined a sort of plastic yellow dome over America and the missiles would come in and bounce off. And he was obstinate and Gorbachev was obstinate. He should have said, OK, Reagan, have your Star Wars, because he knew it wouldn't work. Can't work, according to the laws of physics. But they got hung up on that. And I remember Schultz came out of the conference and had, and had a conference 
a media conference, and he said, we did this, and we did this, and we agreed to this, and then his face fell. And then the Cold War ended, and we were so exhausted, we lay back on our couch, they talked about peace dividend, but the Pentagon didn't get rid of their missiles. They need them for their masculinity. It's like these guys who drive very loud motorbikes and very loud cars, you know, and feel their testosterone pumping. It's true. There's an experiment. There was a woman here in San Francisco who was measuring hormones, and there was an altercation in the lab. And she noticed that what happened was the men would go into their room, slam the door, and sit and sulk. The women the next morning came in and they cleaned the benches and made coffee and, and so she thought that's interesting. So she did the hormone levels. Of course, the testosterone went sky high. But in the women, the oxytocin went up. A fascinating hormone, which I was taught in medical school is only secreted when you're lactating. And I know when I fed my babies, I felt I could feed the whole world. It's an amazing hormone. And so women are the peacemakers. 52% of us, and we do nothing. At least in Greece, in Les Estrada, the women, the men were fighting and killing all the time. The women said, no more sex. So they stopped killing. So it seems that sex is more important to men than killing. But the two centers for sex and killing violence are in the midbrain, and they're very closely associated in men, and each secrete dopamine, that lovely feeling you get after an orgasm, you know? And so does violence. So sex and violence are intimately interlinked in the male brain. You know, why do men um, have erections when they go into battle? Why do they play porno films to men in aircraft carriers before they take off to kill people and drop their bombs? Why do men rape women when they conquer a territory? I don't understand it, and so that's what I'm trying to explore in this book. I don't think it'll do any good, but at least it's trying to work out why. Like, why did we get polio till Jonah's sulk and Sabine appeared and isolated the polio virus and we eliminated it? Now I've got to find the etiology of killing. So we've got a lot of work to do, but I want to say to each of you, and I only came here to empower you, if I could do what I did, and I had three kids and a husband and stuff, each of you can be as powerful as the most powerful person who ever lived. And if you really realise how your life is sacred, and I know you do, because well, I've treated so many people who are on their deathbeds, or people whose children are dying and they fall into my arms and weep. When you're at the coal face of life, then you realise how precious it is. A man came up to me once and he said, well, there are two things. He said, I've got prostate cancer. He said, and I'm on oestrogen. He said, the first time I've ever felt like shopping. <laughs> and then another man came up and who is dying of prostate cancer. And he said, I'm smelling the roses, looking at the dahlias. How precious this is. And what responsibility, ultimate responsibility, each one of us have. And you can be as powerful as the most powerful person who ever lived if you follow your intuition. Take in what I've said. Go through the grief. Don't have a drink. Don't listen to music. Feel. Swim the river of grief. And out of that, you'll get the message. You'll know what you have to do. No one else can tell you what to do. You've got your own special, special abilities and potentials. And turn this country upside down. There are enough people here to do that. So, looks like I've finished. <laughs> but I have really, I just would like to say, Thank you for coming. And it's only if Americans abolish nuclear weapons will Russia follow. So you hold the evolution in the palm of your hand. It's your responsibility. Totally. Do it. Thank you.